Good morning, everybody. How are you? Are you ready to worship? Are you ready to encounter the Lord? Are you ready to be transformed by the word of the Lord and by his presence and his glory? I don't know about you, but I don't come to a, into a worship gathering just to do an activity and check it off my week. You know, we've all done that. But I come expectant, expecting to be changed, expecting for the Holy Spirit to do something as we assemble together, as we encounter him in worship, as we open our hearts to receive whatever it is he wants to give us. Sometimes it's personal and it's just something he drops into you in the midst of the moment. And sometimes it's a deposit that's made into all of us at the same time. And I'm expecting today that we're going to get both. And there was a word that was given in this house back in the spring that because of the people that we're bringing in month after month after month, that the walls and the very atmosphere was being saturated with the revelation of the Lord. So that as that revelation continues to build in this house, it is causing a fresh move of life into us. And you can feel it. It's going to release new sounds. So today, as we start, I want you posturing your heart to receive without preconceived notions without expectations of what has been. But Lord, we ask right now we want you. And I'm asking Father in this house that in the name of Jesus that we would be like receptive sponges to be saturated with your presence and with your glory. That we would be saturated with the word of the Lord. That we would be so saturated that when we get bumped up next to or squeezed, what comes out of us is you. So Lord, today we posture our hearts. We bring our mind, our will, and our emotions into submission to the Spirit of the living God. Have your way. Have your way. Lord, activate us to do your bidding. Activate us to worship in a new way, to do something in worship we've not done before, to move out into a new place of expression of our love and our adoration and our surrender to you. Lord, activate us to be who you called us to be. In the name of Jesus, I break off every assignment of hell that has come against us individually and corporately. I say, enemy, you have no right, no place, and no portion to us. We are covered in the blood of, the, of Yeshua. I say, all religious mindsets bow to the name of Jesus. All intimidation, fear. All mindsets that would war against the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, bow now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I speak a releasing over your people to move in freedom and liberty. To express the passion of their heart. Lord, stoke the fires of passion in this place. In this season of awakening, awaken us in a new way, God. Stir us up in a new way. And we're no longer satisfied with the awakening of yesterday. But God, we're hungry. We're hungering and thirsting for you. 
We want you more than we want our very next breath. Let us be more undignified. Let us move to the side of inconvenience, no longer on the side of convenience and comfort. But God, we choose to step into the place of inconvenience so that glory may be birthed out of us. Glory may be birthed in our midst. Move out of your convenience. Move into the place of inconvenience. Let it be, Father, in the name of Jesus. And now I'm speaking to you. As God moves on you to worship, don't feel like you have to stay in your aisle. There's room to move. There's room at the altar. If you need to come and bow, if you want to come dance, if you want to just lay prostrate, find you a place. But move out of the ordinary. Move out of the normal expectation. Move into the place where God says, I see you moved into inconvenience. Now you become a doorway of glory. So, Lord, loose the doorways of glory. Loose the doorways of glory. Release. Beverly came and brought a word to me that I really believe is where we are. And I I started not to have a release it because we're doing it, but I felt like there was a deposit by her releasing the word that would break us into even another dimension. Because it has to do all with the sound and the worship. So Beverly, just share it and then pray whatever God tells you to do. I would just, when I was just back there and I had to come up to, and I was sharing with Sandra and Pastor Jackie, I just noticed there was anointing. It was an anointing that's coming out of this sax. It was like releasing. There's something it's communicating yeah. and releasing yeah. into the atmosphere and it's releasing the anointing of the impossible and of the breakthrough anointing that is taking us up is um, it's almost even communicating to the our angelic army. Yeah, it's a yeah, sound yeah, yeah. that's communicating something of war to the angelic army to wage war over Georgia and 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 Atlanta and and what he's wanting to do in this ecclesia. So Father, we come in agreement with the sound of the Lord that you are releasing. We come in agreement with the angelic host that is receiving the orders from you through this sex, through the music, through through the song, Father, that you are releasing, oh God. So Father, we thank you, oh Lord, and we declare in Jesus' name yes. that the breakthrough anointing is going yes. forth throughout this region. That Lord, people are getting set free, not only in this sanctuary, but Lord, they're getting set free in their homes. Yes. They're getting set free over their businesses. They're getting set free over their schools. Father, we're thinking that there's a divine shift that is going on in a divine reversal that is being released through the sound that is out released in this place in Jesus' name. Release your sound. Release your sound. That there is an anointing for you to sow into this right now. Don't wait. Because what happens when you sow into the moment of a prophetic unction and a sound that is being released, it secures it for you. And on this word, it secures it for this region that the sound to set this region free to activate the angel armies to do the decrees of the Lord gets secured. So ask the Lord and be obedient and sow into this moment in Jesus' name. While this uh, intense worship was going on, I heard the Lord say he is inviting us into a divine entanglement. 
that he is taking us up into places that are unknown. And when Kevin begins to deliver his word, says the Lord, the mysteries of God that Paul wrote about will begin to be revealed. But he's entangling us in his uh, his fine linen. I, I saw fine linen being wrapped a, around everyone. It's a, it's, a, it's a song of love and praise and worship, but it's a song of war, says the Lord. It's a dance of war that comes out in this divine entanglement. And he is entangling you with the purpose. Purpose is not only for your family and yourselves, but for our state and for our nation. This is a coming into a divine entanglement, says the Lord. And as you begin to engage with me, says God, I will bring you into the heights that will give you strategies and answers that you have been coming to me over the decades, says the Lord. But stay in this place of divine entanglement. Last week, I think Beverly got, I want you to look at this picture. This was taken last week when in obedience, Susan stepped up to pray. Do you see that? That's divine entanglement. That's the releasing of the glory of God that's unlocked as we step out in obedience. And so God's asking us, will we simply step into what he's saying? Stop thinking about it. Get out of your head. Get out of your reasoning. We're trained to think things through. And we can think things to death. But an obedience unlocks glory. Because obedience is a place of inconvenience. For those of you who were not here on uh, Friday night, that was Ken's word to us. Move from convenience to inconvenience. And I immediately thought of this picture. So in this season, God is releasing a new measure of glory as we step into the place of obedience. As we step into the place of releasing through us what he has said and we do what he says to do father i pray over us right now in the name of jesus that we break out of our mental reasoning and our mental gymnastics to try to prove well is it really god i break us out of even that place of the gideon arguments where we say god give us another sign give us another sign give us i break it off of us right now in jesus name and i say father we're stepping into the place of divine entanglement out of the entanglement of the enemy and in to the glory entanglement that flows out of heaven Lord the atmosphere is getting more and more thin between heaven and earth interaction of angels the heavenly army and the earthly army. Even interaction with the great cloud of witnesses. Father, break us out of our mindsets that try to reason that away. We're spiritual beings, God. We live out of our spirit to be and to do according to your good pleasure. I want, to, I want Pat and Winston to step up here and Corinne and your team that are going out evangelizing this afternoon. Y'all know who you are, Andy and Lena, Catherine, Francis, maybe. I'm going to tell you, folks, we're going to be seeing more and more of the sending out. Because an apostolic house has to send out, activate it. Pat and Winston are headed to St. Simon's to meet with pastors there about restoring the foundations. Then they're going on to Ormond Beach to teach 
on restoring the foundations to get more people activated to minister inner healing and deliverance because as the harvest comes in so I find it very fitting that we have those representing the ministry to get people healed and delivered standing in the midst of the evangelist because they have to partner together because a lot of times what we've done is we've had the evangelist go out people pray and come into the kingdom but they don't know how to keep moving forward so father right now over this team we send them out into the harvest we send this team out into a mighty harvest not just the kingdom of salvation but the gospel of the kingdom of god god that they come bringing the kingdom that they come bringing them bringing the message that translates people out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your glory and your light and we send pat and winston into saint simon's and into ormond beach freshly anointed in the power of the holy spirit to release an impartation not just information not just systems and methods but god an impartation that brings people into freedom into liberty into wholeness that they will multiply God I decree that the multiplication of evangelism is coming into this house the multiplication of the pastors are coming into this house to care for the sheep the word is prepare for the harvest prepare for the harvest so God we position ourselves and we send these out into the harvest for your glory and your honor in Jesus name amen thank you wow so if you can tell I lost my shoes it was a combination of the glory and I couldn't stand but it was reality it was a com it was the pain <laughs> It was like, you know what? I am not going to stay in a place of pride and have to wear my shoes. Because <laughs> it was hurting and it was distracting. Wow. We may call you back up in a little bit. Wow. What you broke through today was not just for you. It's for the house. So keep breaking and pressing through. And so... Let the sound of that sax come forth. And woo! And what about these singers breaking out in prophetic song? Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you all. Wow, what a weekend we have had. If you are not here Friday night for Ken Malone, I strongly encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and listen. He brought a word that's really an on-time word for us of moving from the side of convenience where we do what fits us, what's comfortable for us, to the side of inconvenience where it takes us out of our comfort zone. And I really believe we have to really ask the Lord, what are you asking us to give up in order to move into the place of inconvenience. And he used this phrase, he says, walking on the side of inconvenience unlocks glory. It unlocks glory. We're not going to get the measure of glory God's promised us if we simply go with what's comfortable and what's easy. Revival never, ever comes to the complacent and excuses it never ever comes revival comes when people decide to go where it's dangerous or they decide to meet in a barn in the Hebrides and pray for weeks and months all night until the heavens open We talk, we want revival. Are we willing to pay the price?
Are we willing to give up the ease and the comfort? Our nation's in a desperate place right now. And we can look throughout history, not just American history, but throughout history. When God breaks in, in real reviving, sustaining power. And notice I'm saying reviving, sustaining power. And the reason is because we've had lots of like awakenings. We've had refreshings. We've had these places where people came into an encounter with the Lord. And they're marvelous. But they've not been sustained because we quickly go back to our ways of complacency and comfort. I've been crying out for revival for 35 years. We're here because of that call. It actually goes back to 1975 with an encounter I had with the Lord. And I won't stop pursuing. And God's asking me some things. Are you willing to take another step of inconvenience? Some prayer meetings are not going to be convenient. They're not going to be convenient, folks. But God's giving us an opportunity to move in to what we've been dreaming of. What we've been dreaming of. Let's take that dream and bring it into reality. Just real quickly, I want to get Kevin and Rose up. Um, got the announcements. Uh, this Tuesday night, we will have Advancing Faith. We're going to go back into our uh, discipleship and intercession time from 7 to 9, really focusing on the words that were released uh, Friday night, and I anticipate the words that will be released this morning so that we can pray those in. If we don't steward the words that we receive, we will never lay hold of them. So that's what we will be doing Tuesday night. Please come out and join us. It'll be a powerful time. Um, starting on the 16th of October, the Lord gave me an instruction a few weeks ago that we were to build an altar of worship across the state of Georgia. Not just us, but I was to issue a sound of invitation, a sound for people all across the state to gather in their locations to worship. And we've got quite a number that are, but if you know people in other parts of the state, send them the information. You can go to theglorynet.com. And as we see worship surrounding this state, where prophetically we were told that there was a spider's web across the state, we've been dealing with the demonic spider's web, but now it is time to burn that thing up completely with the fires of worship. Because if we just stay at dealing with the demonic, we're not going to come into the fullness of the manifestation of what God wants. So God said, many things are not needful, but an altar of worship is required. So we're going to be gathering here on Sunday nights from 5 to 7, starting on the 16th through the 6th. That's what it is right now. Now, stay flexible with me. There's another ministry in town here in Peachtree Corners that they said, we want a partner. Why don't you come to us? So I'm working out those details. So that would even be better in my book if we get to partner with somebody else so that we can do this together in the region. But do share it. I'm excited about it, and people are excited across the state, so that's good. And then uh, we're still finishing up the Right Now campaign to get people voting. Um, we have to pray, but we also have to vote. And over a third of believers, 50% of believers, right? Are one in three believers don't vote. What would happen if that one in three gets activated to vote according to kingdom principles? according to what the Bible says. And as a believer, I'll just boldly tell you, you cannot vote for somebody who stands for abortion. You cannot do it. 
if you do, you need to go before the Lord and say, inspect my heart. Because that is coming into an alignment with the principality of death, of Baal, and of Moloch. And you're saying we're willing to sacrifice our children on an altar to Baal. So you can't do it. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to tell you who you can't vote for. <laughs> Keep it straight, right? Um, that, our children are in the midst of uh, preparing for Sukkot, which is in a couple of weeks. They're learning some dances and all kinds of fun things. So um, encourage your kids to be here, parents. Uh, just encourage your kids to study with them. When the, they bring home stuff with them, get into it with them. Study the, the feast, the fall feast that we're in the middle of, and help them come into an alignment with our Hebraic roots. It'll be a powerful thing for our children. And then uh, on October 21st is our next prophetic hub with Isaac Petrie. And a lot of you have heard him through Glory of Zion. Um, Catherine Forader is here from Kentucky, came down for the weekend, and she said, I just always buckle my seatbelts and prepare to go tilt because <laughs> he's, he's fast, he's brilliant. He sings, he writes songs, he's an incredible preacher. And just be prepared. Buckle your seatbelts and prepare to tilt. But you're going to love him. And he really brings a kingdom word that's needed in the hour. And then November 4th, we have Chuck Pierce for our next one. If you have not gone online and put your name on the list already, I encourage you to do so. You want to be sure your seat is secured. And we can seat about 500 if I get all the chairs in here. And by then, hopefully, maybe we'll have some overflow ready because we may need it at this time in season. So, Kevin and Rose, would you come? Oh, Rose is coming first. All right, come on. Woohoo! I'm honored to have these two here. We've been friends for a long time. I see some fo new folks in the house. And I just want you to know, these, this is family. This isn't just ministry coming from another state or another nation. This is family. And um, they've deposited into this house for the last 18 years, wow. even before this was CityGate, because I would have them in for events. And so there's been many, many words that between Rose and Kevin that we have worked with. When the dogs are barking, keep the wagons <laughs> keep rolling. The wagons rolling Kevin. That one was key in that season. So would you stand, Kevin, just stand here to the front. We do something here. I want, well, why don't you stand right here and you can do this. Ah, look at there. He's, I would never do that in a million years. <laughs> Just extend your hands. Father, I thank you for Kevin and Rose Sambrook. I thank you for their daughter, Melanie. Thank you for the deposit that's already been made here this weekend. But Lord, today, we put a demand on this couple to bring forth the word of the Lord that will be as fresh seed into the soil that has been prepared, that there would come forth a, even a double harvest, not just in this house, but Lord, a double harvest into their ministry of covenant love, yes. apostolic center in Belfast and into Rama Restoration Ministries. God, a double portion anointing, but God, a double portion provision to be unlocked that they would not be those that are simply scraping by in this season, but they shift into the double portion of provision of everything that is needed, that the house and ministry that they lead would become Goshen in the land of famine. Lord, that they would be so filled up with you that their, uh, the pastors in the house and the other leaders in the house would be so ignited with the fire of God that whether they're coming and going, it would not cause the flame to flicker in the least, but it would continue to blaze greater and greater and greater 
provider. And God, in the name of Jesus, we say they are establishing an altar of worship in Ireland and in Scotland, in Wales, across all of the UK, and even into Europe. Father, that there's a strategy that they are releasing even out of the glory net here. They're releasing a glory net across Europe that will cause the fires of awakening that once went into the nations of the world out of Ireland will once again come. There will be a fresh impartation, a fresh release of the glory of God that the Irish who impacted the nations as they were sent out will once again be sent out in great power with everything that is needed for this day and the days ahead in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, if you weren't awake before that, you're awake now. I'm, awake. I'm telling you. What Jackie doesn't know is that I've had permission um, in Mariah Chapel in Wales to do a worship event. Now, that's where revival broke out. So we're, and there was a prophetic word that when Ireland strikes the match, Wales is going to go on fire again. So we're going to do, when she's going, when, when, well, I have to set that up yet, but it could be March, but it could be later. We might tie it in with your tour. Who knows what we'll do. We can do what we need to do when we need to do it. That's where we're at. But my goodness, what a joy and delight it is to be with you all. Um, I'm going to do something really weird. That's not, that's pretty normal for me. Okay, so those of you who were at the conference yesterday would know that, and thank you for that. I'm going to take a photograph. Because I want your faces. I want all your wee faces. Look at those lovely faces. Okay, now I can go, okay, I'm going to pray for that one. We're going to pray for that one. We're going to wake that one up. We're going to, yeah. <laughs> I hope you had your eyes open when I was taking that photo. Because I'll be like, come on, go wake them up. Wake them up. And, you know, and they're probably wide awake. And they're going, why is she waking me up? I was awake the whole time. <laughs> but what an honor it is this morning to be with you all and to be with Jackie and with Mike. We have had some great food, some great fellowship. It's just been incredible. But thank you for hosting us again this morning. We do feel like this is part of our extended family here. As Jackie said, I couldn't believe it when she said 18. You know, we met when we were five. You do know that. <laughs> like 18 years. And we've been coming here 18 years. My Lord, that's incredible. But I don't feel a day older. I always say I feel pretty young. Feel pretty young to me, so I keep touching myself. It feels good. <laughs> and maybe it doesn't always look good, but it feels good. But if you weren't here yesterday, our daughter Melanie is with us, and we were blessed to have her the last 12, 11, 12 days. It's been a great journey. Melanie just stepped out from being a lawyer four weeks, five weeks ago and stepped into her business uh, in a full measure, and God is blessing her beyond measure and going, this is just the start. I believe this is just the start. So do pray for her business, Melanie Bond Boutique, please pray, because I believe the blessing of the Lord and the favor of the Lord is upon her, and it's just going to be exponential growth. That's what I'm believing for. Amen. We have Alan and Debbie. Would you stand as well? Melanie, stand there and let anybody who wasn't at that conference, uh, yeah, just wave at everybody like we do the waving thing. <laughs> wave at them, people. Wave. I told the ladies yesterday. I explained yesterday to the ladies that at home, you know, we, we kind of have a conversation when the people are around the dinner table, then we have a conversation when we go to the door with them. We stand pa past the door. We don't let them out. We still have another conversation. Oh, did I tell you? I forgot to tell you. Then when we walk them to the car, oh, and let me tell you about this. I didn't tell you about that. We get to the car. Then we, they roll the window down. We're talking in the window. Did I tell you that? And, and, it's just, and then when they're driving off, we're like, okay, bye, bye. And we see them right around the corner. And then we go in. But when we first came here to America, I think it was Seattle, people just went in and closed the door. <laughs> we were most offended. I was like, what? Do they not love us? They don't love us. They were just pretending to be nice. They actually closed the door. What? Cheerio. <laughs> I was like, what happened? What happened? But now we've got to know that that's not always the way. They really do love us. They just don't want to see, they don't want to see us, see them cry when we leave. <laughs> that's what I tell myself now. <laughs> <laughs> but Alan and Debbie's with us, bless her. I mean, Debbie has yesterday worked so hard, and we, I want to honor you and thank you for that, Debbie. You've done it 
everywhere we've been. But yesterday was such a full-on day of just working. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan, for your patience and grace with the crazy one that you really don't know that well. But now I think, oh, my Lord, will I ever go on a tour with her again? I don't know. But they've been with us, and they're going to continue in some of the other places with us. They have a home in Florida that they go back and forward. I am not jealous. <laughs> Just wanted to get that out there real quick. <laughs> but they are blessed to have that. They come back and forward, so maybe you'll see them again soon. But uh, we're blessed to have you with us. Thank you. Well, now... Uh, when we were flying over here, the Lord gave me a word um, for the year ahead. And I love how he does that. I think he gets my attention on planes because I'm, that's the place where I'm still and I can't go anywhere else. No one can call me. I can't receive a phone call. But uh, just sitting on the plane, the Lord gave me uh, a word for the year ahead. We all know there's Rosh Hashanah. And I want to say Happy New Year to you all. Um, Okay, see, when I say Happy New Year, I would like to hear we Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I received that. My year's going to be happy. It's going to be sweet. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Ladies, you were here yesterday. You know what it's like. If you want to jump up and run around, like, you know, just, just go for it. Just go for it. The men are, won't be intimidated at all. They'll join you. So he gave me this word, and this is what he said, and it's a very serious word, I believe, and I believe it's a word that we all need to take note of. He started it with this, I'm crowning this year with my wisdom. My sons and daughters need my wisdom to choose well. Choose your alignments, choose your community, choose your friends, choose your business partners. Just because, and this is a key line, just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's my way today. Listen to my voice, he said, and choose well. If you listen, you will hear the rhythm of my heartbeat in order to move. Stay in time. Even if it's the faintest whisper, you can still hear me. Then he said this, I have been marking my people this past two years, marking them with as pure or as unholy, marking them as authentic or counterfeit my name on each one and by this stage it should be visible so look again and see with the eyes of discernment check the heart motivation the who's who and then he said this as you're about to find out that was like an out hallelujah moment it was almost like i've been marking for the last two years people i've been going to my people i've been marking you those who are not really my people i've been marking and you better check out who you're aligned with, who you're with, who you're going to go to war with. Because in this season, you need to know who's with you and who's against you. You need to know where you're going. You can't, like we heard, we can't be in the convenient place anymore. That's what we heard on Friday night. I was like, oh, Lord, is there any convenient places in my life? There probably are many. But we've got to step into in inconvenient. It's no longer days of compromising in faith, but days of immovable faith, unswerving faith, relentless pursuit of the kingdom, knowing you belong to me and walking as my sons, using your authority in my kingdom. I have written restitution throughout the year. There were times you will see things returned to their original intent, how they should have been in me. You will see the could have beens corrected. You will see times where I will release the angelic to pay back what is rightfully yours. Miracles you and I only know about. Now, there's some things in life that you and him only know about, and all of a sudden, they're going to come back. All of a sudden, you're going to see it restored. People who have wronged you will come to you this year and apologize for what they have done. It will be a suddenly. They will see you have been marked by me for blessing and not judgment. I love that. Thank you, Lord. So use wisdom and continue to walk in my ways, allowing me to mold your character. Key line coming up here. My spotlight will be shining more on character this year. My church has focused so much on the gifts that they've been elevated to a level above character, and this is not my ways. You know, we can have all the character, but I'm telling you what, your character will take you where you're... Or your gifting will take you where your character cannot keep you. Character is key. And a good character is a must to use your gifts correctly, he said. No selfish ambition in sight. 
I will have pure vessels worthy of honor. So I'm cleaning up and clearing out those things in your life that is not me. You will not, you will not walk in the fullness of your authority unless you seek my holiness. Lord, help us. Get on our faces. Many have experienced great loss, but I declare this will be a year of recovery, both materially and spiritually, for my rivers will be flowing in and through, bringing life and bringing healing. Get ready for the water to saturate you people. The river of God's just going to hit you. That tsunami is just going to overtake you. In the year ahead, there'll be great turmoil and heartache in the world. But do not despair because you've been marked by me and you can hold your head high and walk in my wisdom and provision. You will see unity in communities. That's why I love that other church wanting to do this thing with you. Unity in communities, unity in families, and unity in my body. Unity to cover and unity to bring provision. They will come together and the world will watch in awe. This is a good line. The world will watch in awe of how my body will provide for the hurting. Provision will come to you, to work out through you. So don't hold on to it in this season. Share it and more will come. Don't operate in the fear of lack when you hear the, the news. Oh, we're going into this awful recession. Things are going to get so bad. How are you going to heat your home this year? I am tired of it at home. I just go, well, I live in Goshen. I don't know what you're going to do, but I live in Goshen. My God has never let me down. He's provided everything that I've always needed. Sometimes it might have been 11.59, but it always came. And it always came right on time. I'm telling you, don't you listen to that news. Don't you listen to those negative words that flow in and through that television and radio and however else you hear it. Just cut it off. Turn it off. And declare, I live in Goshen. So don't you operate in the fear of lack. He said, come up higher and stand on my holy hill. Be uncompromising immovable. Take your place and know me. Businesses you thought were dying in your community will begin to flourish again. This will be evidence of my work, my hand at work. So watch for those signs. That shops that you thought, oh, they're getting there. it's not going good there. All of a sudden, when you begin to pray, God's going to see them flourish again, and you're going to know God's on the move in our community. Then he said this, I'm holding back the tide from Russia. I am working behind the scenes. Men turn on my command. Don't you listen to that news? Men turn on my command. Some nations will be judged this year and consequences delivered to those leaders who looked away instead of making a stand, to those who enabled and empowered wrong choices. Corruption will float to the top for all eyes to see. Social media will be alive with the truth and you will be shocked because I have said, I have had enough. Thank you, Lord. We all know there's many leaders out there who have done this when they should have been doing this. No. So this is the year, people, where you're going to see that happen. I believe it. God said it, so I believe it. And then he said this, I speak the word stable over you, one who is not likely to give away or overturn, one who is firmly fixed in place, one who will not collapse under the pressure. You will hear the sound of a structure falling, one who no one thought ever would. Listen for the sound. Shock waves around the world will be felt. The Lord says there's a pressure coming that many will not be able to stand up under, but I have a stable people, ones who are uncompromising in their faith, strong and tenacious and ready to run to the battle. You will see a stabilizing in your life. Those emotions of the past years brought on by fear will cease as you look to me. No more highs and lows, no more ups and downs, but a stabilizing and establishing of who you are in me, no matter what the world is going through. Remember, you are not of this world. Amen. Wisdom and restitution and recovery are yours this year. You will no longer blend in out of fear of being attacked. Your chameleon coat, I love this, cast off. And now you stand out wearing the coat of my favor. Yeah. Got to stand out. 
You can walk through any storm being a transparent vessel, one who is pure, holy, uncompromising, and full of compassion. You are mine and you are strong, so don't doubt it when the pressure comes. There is pressure coming, people. You're strong and stable in me, so stay steady when the fight comes. You are able. You will have more than enough. You'll be filled up to overflowing to the blessing of many. So it's coming in and it's going through. Coming in, going through. You're just going to get this suddenly. Whoa, where'd that come from? Oh, here, I need to help you. That's what's going to happen this year. Use your voice to speak life, to release blessing. Your storehouses are now ready for increase. So watch me move on your behalf. At times it will come through the most unexpected places, but your barns will be filled. Will be filled with bountiful, this is what he said, with bountiful blessings. It's not a word I use, but when he said it, I went, woo, I'll have that bountiful blessing. He's going to have a bountiful blessing coming to his bride this year. So I lose wisdom, restitution, recovery, boldness, and discernment for the days ahead. I open your windows of heaven to release those bountiful blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Just pray in the Spirit for a moment. Allow that to seep in. Thank you, Father. The Word of God says, He who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. How do we sow to the Spirit? through the Word of God. And when a, a remote Word of God is released into the realm of the Spirit, it will produce a harvest. So, Father, we pray that with the good soil of people's hearts today, it will produce a hundredfold in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, I want to add my thanks to uh, Mike and Jackie for their excellent hospitality, fine cuisine, and uh, also the education on how to pronounce certain words. Uh, apparently... Um, uh, Certain nuts are called pecan, or uh, pecan, not pecan nuts. So I, I think I was about five minutes in the car with Mike, and he said, that's embarrassing, the way you're pronouncing that. So I, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And we had some pecan nuts with uh, the sprouts last night that Jackie cooked. Excellent cuisine. Yeah, real fed uh, feast. It's, it's wonderful to have Deborah and Alan with us as well, uh, friends from uh, our part of the pond, and it's been great to spend time with you guys, and every blessing, I know we're going to eat together, but every blessing as you travel on to Kentucky and, and uh, further afield, and we'll connect again before we finish the trip. Melanie, uh, your mum and I are so proud of um, how God has blessed uh, you and us through you on, on this trip, and um, thank you so much for... Uh, being with us for the last 10 days and just to see God moving through your life and uh, thank your family for, for sowing you uh, as well. I know that when you go back, Timothy is expecting a full schedule of uh, entertainment when he comes back, activities. <laughs> I don't think he understands jet lag or anything like that, but yeah, praise God. Um, before I release the word um, that the Lord has laid on my heart, and I feel an intensity about it. I spent pretty much all day yesterday just seeking the Lord and praying into this, this word. And there is an intensity about it, a seriousness about it. And it, it is going to require unpacking. So, Jackie, when you said that you unpack words, I think it's on the Tuesdays after the meeting, uh, there's going to be lots of things to unpack. And I don't think I have the time to do it justice because it will take several um, sessions to do it, but I'm just going to release today what the Lord has laid on my heart for you and the body of Christ uh, as well. But before I move on to that, uh, I had the pleasure at the Lord's invitation of writing my second book. It's called Dove of Fire, uh, and the subject is one of the most important figures in Christian history from our part of the world. Uh, an individual by the name of Columba, or in the Irish tongue, Column Keel, which means dove of the church. 
And you need to understand what happened in his life if you understand where the Lord is taking us in the future. Because I believe not only in the Twin Peaks of prophecy, but also the Twin Peaks of history. And this man was a, a powerhouse and saturated Ireland with apostolic hubs uh, right in the immediate aftermath of the implosion of the Roman Empire. And Ireland, which had been called by the Romans Hibernia, which is the place of winter, barbaric, pagan, dark. Through Patrick and then through Columba, it was transformed as people referred to it as the light of the world. It had the largest concentration of apostolic hubs or monasteries uh, the world uh, had ever seen and in the world at that time. And out of that spread the extension of the kingdom by force through 24-7 praise, prayer, and worship, through discipline and devotion, uh, creating thin places. And uh, your apostle mentioned that this morning. Jackie mentioned that this morning. Thin places where portals of heaven were opened, altars of fire were created. And so I would commend to you, I don't have the time to go into his story, but if you need to understand where you're going, you need to understand where you have come from. And uh, this is our pedigree. And so Dove of Fire, an immensely important uh, person in Christian history. In fact, William Branham and Paul Keith Davis and other people have referred to him as the significant figure in one of the seven candlesticks, references to the ages of the church. Uh, and so at Columba, Dove of the Church. I wonder if you stand with me and uh, just, just pray for a second. I, I feel that we need to prepare our hearts uh, for what the Lord is going to release uh, this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hmm. My dear Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here and you're ministering and working among us even as we have been worshiping and praying today. We pray, Lord, that you would send the plowshare of your Holy Spirit deep into the soil of our hearts, Father, that we may receive the ingrafted word that may yield a full harvest a hundredfold in the days and weeks and months and years that lie ahead. So, Father, would you do it? Would you send the rain of your blessing upon us today in Jesus' precious name? Amen. And uh, just to say, the book is available after the service uh, uh, as well. I wonder if you turn to Psalm 132. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. How he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob, surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed, I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed, 
His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. As I was meditating on that psalm yesterday, the Lord began to show me that you can divide it into two parts. The first part, from verses 1 to 5, refers to Christ's redemptive work in the world from the time of his ministry until his death on the cross when he said, it is finished. And so when you read, surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed, I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob, we see that Christ's ministry was to prepare a new dispensation. I'm not using that in the theological sense that we have come to know dispensationalism, but a, an era, a, a, a new dimension, where an altogether different temple was going to be furnished on earth. And so when you read that, that no rest, the zeal that tore him up until his work was completed was going to be until he found out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. And in Hebrews, we find the fulfillment of that, where he says in 9.24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Something happened at the crucifixion when Christ said, It is finished. A work was completed, and with the ascension of Christ into the heavenly realms, and you can read it in Revelation 4 and 5 in its fullest sense, a completion of the work on earth in part was done, whereby it became true that a new temple, a resting place for the presence of God was furnished. Ephesians 2 verse 20 to 22 says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets concerning the ecclesia. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And so Christ labored and toiled, Gethsemane, almost reaching the pinnacle where he sweated great drops of blood, and then reaching the zenith of his earthly ministry on the cross where he died, gave up the ghost, and said, it is finished. He found that place for the Lord, a habitation of the mighty God of Jacob. And on the outpouring on the day of Pentecost, God filled his new temple and he has been filling it ever since. And so we say, in our day, as there has never been more expectancy, you can cut the atmosphere with a knife of expectation, that there is going to be a cloudburst of glory that is going to pour out upon the world and the church. And the Lord says, it is time for you to enter in. And so our cry should be, verse 8, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Now something happened to the ark of the covenant. It was captured by the Philistines. Don't have time to go into all of that. And then David saw uh, that it needn't be there anymore, that it was time to bring the ark of God's covenant back to where it ought to be, the place of its rest. And so in 2 Samuel 6, they set out with high hopes for that ox cart, a new ox cart, slapped it on there, and it wobbled and it wibbled, and Uzzah decided the best way to stop it falling off was to put his hand forth, and fire came out and struck Uzzah dead. And David was grieved. And the place where it happened was the th uh, threshing floor of Nacon, and in David's disgust, he left it with Obed-Edom, where God blessed that man. 
It's always important that when you look at names of places or individuals, that you discern or ascertain the meaning of those words because encoded within that, very often God is saying something to us. And so before the ark found its resting place in the tabernacle of David, something had to happen. That at the place of Nacon's threshing floor, which means prepared, at the prepared place, human strength died. And the blessing began to flow at Obed-Edom, which means serving Edom, serving the red, referring to the blood of Christ. And so Nacon prepared Uzzah's strength, Obed-Edom serving, serving Edom, read the blood. In the prepared place, the cross, the strength of man was struck down. Christ, the last Adam, said, it is finished. And passing through the Red Sea of Christ's blood, we enter into blessing. Did you notice I used the phrase, the last Adam? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 says this, and so it is written. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. We are the sons of God. We are no longer of Adam's race. We are the offspring of Christ. And it says in Romans 8 verse 14, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 19 says this, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And Galatians 4, verse 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The idea of sonship we will return to. The sending of God's Spirit into the sons and the church we will return to. But something happened when Jesus said, it is finished, the last Adam died. And a new generation, a new creation was created to facilitate, sustain, and carry the presence of God in the earth realm as priests and kings extending the kingdom. And so after Obed-Edom's period of blessing, David ascertained the right way of bringing the ark into Jerusalem. And there it rested in the tabernacle of David. And after Pentecost, there was some debate as to how should the Gentiles be qualified and is this right that it happens that they are absorbed and baptized into the new body of Christ? Would they have to observe the law? Or was there altogether a new era of promise? And so the council of Jerusalem recognized that God was doing something new. A new tabernacle was being created. And they used the reference of tabernacle of David. David's tabernacle, Acts 15, verse 16. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof. And I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. And so the message this morning is, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, into the new tabernacle. It is the empowering of the ecclesia. In whom ye are builded together, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And so the ark of God's presence has come to rest in the ecclesia, which is now the temple of God in and through and for the Spirit. The residency of God, the dwelling place of God, the holy of holies of God's presence is in the ecclesia. And in verse 9 of the scripture that we read, it says that the priests will be clothed in righteousness. Now that's not just a good feeling. That's not so focus and oohs and ahs and aren't we so good and we're washed clean. No, no, it says that we reign in life because of the righteousness by one Christ Jesus. Romans 5 verse 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, say much more, much more, they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. And then in verse 11, there is the invitation to sit on the throne with the Lord. 
It says, The Lord hath sown, Psalm 132, verse 11, The sword hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony, that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. It is about kingdom rulership in the earth realm. Well, you might say, well, David's greatest son. Yes, we understand. The Jerusalem is the city of the great king, and, De and Jesus on his return shall sit on the throne of David forever. We understand that. But no, no, no. It's much more than that. It is broader than that. It encompasses so much more than that limited understanding. It includes us in rulership now and in the hereafter. Their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. Hebrews 2, verses 10 to 12 says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he and he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my children, or my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And verse 13 says, And again I will put my trust in him. Again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So the promise in Psalm 132 about the children sitting upon the throne is extended to us. And Isaiah 53 verse 10 bears out what I said, that we are a new race. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, or offspring, or children. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. How? Through the ecclesia. John 1 verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you are a child of God, you are born from above. You are entitled to sit on the throne with Christ. Revelation 3 verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me where? In my throne. We are the company of overcomers. But I tell you this, and, and Paul Keith Davis and maybe others have said that they believe in all honesty when they search the Scriptures that the outpouring at Pentecost was but a tithe of that which is to come at the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles as the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the, as the waters cover the sea, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And so what we find is a, an intensity in the knocking of the door of the hearts of the ecclesia so that the fullness of God can step in. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and he will sup with me and I will sup with him. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. And as we open the door to new dimensions and levels of infilling and fullness, authority steps into the body of Christ, the ecclesia, as never before. Psalm 24, verse 9 and 10 says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Salah. Ezekiel 43, verses 4 to 5. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. In the, in the Hebrew tongue, the word east means that which is to the fore, in front. And the Lord spoke to me through this verse of Scripture and said, you can translate it this way. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the fore. There is coming an entrance into the body of Christ of the glory of the Lord that the world has never seen, we have never experienced. 
And so the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And when you drop down to verse 7, God shows the prophet where his resident presence and authority emanates from. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall be the house of Israel. No more defile neither they nor their kings by their whoredom nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. God desires above all in this moment a dwelling place in the ecclesia so that the fullness of his glory and authority can, can begin to flow from the chambers of our unified heart, corporately and individually. You see in verse 13 of the psalm, there is a desire that God has for this dwelling place. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever, verse 14. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Why? Why is he desiring the ecclesia? Why is he desiring to enter in with the fullness of his presence and his glory? I tell you why. It has to do with our releasing authority in the earth realm to extend the kingdom. Listen to Isaiah 51, verse 16. If you want a definition of Zion... We find it here. And I have put words in thy mouth, says the Lord, and I have covered thee with the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Did you capture that? Did you grasp that? Did you understand that? Zion, thou art my people. We are Zion, according to this scripture. And so out of Zion, into which the Lord has put words in our mouth, and he has covered us with the shadow of his hand, so that we may plant the heavens with prophetic decrees and proclamations and prayers, and lay the foundations of the earth, and see the kingdom of God built in the earth realm as never before. You see, Zion is referred to as a city, is it not? We, had, we understood that. Zion is a place. It's a people. It's a people. And Jesus himself identified this place in Matthew 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. There is an unveiling of the sons and daughters of God, that city that is set on a hill, the light of the world that can no longer be hid. There is a great rising of the ecclesia in the earth realm. And rulership and dominion shall begin to extend in the earth realm through this body of the ecclesia. Isaiah 2 verse 3, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, I will call my people Zion, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Many years ago, trying to think, it's probably over 25 years ago, probably around about 1997. In our part of the world, uh, we had the, the conflict known as the Northern Ireland Troubles. And there was the peace process that was underway. And uh, I knew a fellow who was doing the sound for a conference of one particular political party that was dominant then. And he was setting up the sound. And it was to vote on the peace process. And the Lord said to me, say to your friend, ask him to get you into that room so that you and he together can pray and bring oil with you. And so we did that. We went in. It was the day before the conference. And we anointed every single seat with oil. 
We anointed the, oil, the, the walls with oil. And we decreed, Proverbs 9, that wisdom hath built her house. Because the future of a nation depended upon that vote. And so that particular political party assembled the following day and they voted. And whatever way the mathematics went, I don't understand how, the motion was passed in support of the peace process by one vote. For out of Zion, the ecclesia, shall go forth the law and the word of God. And so when you begin to saturate and plant in the heavens and lay foundations on the earth, it's not so that somehow wonderful things happen unseen. It's so that we see a manifestation of the will of God on earth. And then sometime later, in a geographical location, I'm not going to, to mention, you don't need to know that, the Lord had put it in my heart seven years before with a very strong word that something needed to be dealt with. And so seven years later, there was a moment in time when there was an understanding within the body of Christ, the ecclesia in Belfast, that something needed to happen. And so I, with others, coordinated teams. And we went to different geographical locations. We sought the Lord for a script about what to do. And we made those decrees. We did some prophetic acts. Within a, sh within a short period of time, the two main antagonists in the province of Northern Ireland came together and really the peace process began to get underway. And the reason why I'm saying you don't need to know the locations or go into the details, it's done. And we don't need other people ferreting around trying to undo what has been done. So it's done, it's sealed. But again, the groups of churches meeting together, mingling the teams. So it wasn't one church or no, no, one church here. We intermingled. And when we do strategic level warfare, which we do, we seek the Lord and we stick to the script. We don't go off message. We do exactly what he asks us to do. And again, out of Zion went forth the law and the word of the Lord. And things began to happen. Now, we weren't the only ones. Many other people have been doing stuff and had been doing stuff. We added our portion. But the proximity of the assignment to the manifestation of God's wisdom was very short. There was a very short flash to bang. Now here's where I'm coming to. And this is so important for us to understand. All through this service this morning, God has been speaking about the glory coming in, partnering with angels. This is where we are in an exponential explosion of the supernatural. I wouldn't even say that we're on the cusp of it. We've stepped into it. And like the river out of Ezekiel's temple in uh, the chapters 40, whatever it is, onwards, it's only going to increase in the earth realm. And you and I have been invited by the Lord to be a part of that, to form this Zion out of whom shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord, uh, God's people, the ecclesia. And so let me just try and bring this to a conclusion. Rest. Rest. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for a habitation. This is my rest. And the prayer of the psalmist was, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. There is something about the rest of the Lord, the Lord's rest. He says, It's my rest. Because at the place of rest, the spirit filled ecclesia, which is the habitation of God in the spirit, finds that the partnering with the angelic only increases. And there is a reason for it, and I'm going to show you. In Genesis chapter 28, if it's on your screen, I'm not going to read the entirety of the Scripture, but I will just highlight certain things. Jacob is on a journey from one place to another. And it says, He lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. 
And then when he falls asleep with stones as his pillows, he sees something. He sees a ladder set up on the earth. Notice where it is established. It is on the earth. Not in heaven. It is set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and then descending. Ascending and descending. So the earth realm is where the activity of angels is initiated when they go on assignment into the heavenlies and then come down to fulfill that assignment on earth. This tells us something. Whilst Jacob is sleeping, he is at rest. He is motionless. There is no physical activity. It is a supernatural encounter whilst he is at rest in the spirit. And it says he wakes out of his place. Uh, he wakes out of his sleep and says, surely the Lord is in this place. What place? The place of rest. The place of rest of the body of Christ, the ecclesia on earth. Resting. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Now, lest we consign that to some uh, mystical Old Testament experience that tells us something about angels that is intriguing and interesting, but not much more than that, let us fast forward to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But as Christ was a son over his own house, whose house are we? if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm, firm unto the end. And during that rest, the ladder and everything that Jacob experienced, he referred to as the house of God and the gate of heaven. And so we have to begin to see ourselves as God's house. And Jesus is a son over his own house, whose house we are. And that tells us that the, where the ecclesia is, there is a portal that is opened up in the earth realm for God to begin to rule and extend his authority through that. And so it's during the rest that the ladder of God's house, the gate of heaven, is clearly uh, seen. And, 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 and bearing in mind that God desires Zion for his rest. Let's now look at Hebrews 4, verses 1 to, th 1 to 3. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise of being left us of entering his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed to enter into that rest. And Hebrews 4 verse 10 says, For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Jacob is at rest. He sees the ladder on earth extending into heaven. He calls it the house of God. We are the house of whom Jesus is a son over his own house. And so as we enter into rest, we do not do so by our own works or activity, but by the rest of faith. Because as Jackie or somebody said this morning, we start rationalizing things, and when we do that, we ration out the enemy's lies, and we see ourselves not as God sees us, but a and a, 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 a dysfunctional identity, and God says, no, you are Zion. You are my house. You are entering into my rest by faith, not by works of the law, but by faith. And the Spirit comes, the promise of the Spirit comes by faith, not by works of the law. And so you begin in the Spirit, but the temptation of the body of Christ is to continue through human effort. And God says, no, that's not happening in this, this new era, this dimension. It's not happening because you're entering in by faith.
But let's look at this Zion and, and the, the understanding of, of angels. In Hebrews 12, verse 22, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. And Jackie was telling us this morning that Tishri has to do with the firstborn. This is precisely the month when God wants to announce to us, or remind us at least, that we are the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are Zion, with whom we partner with innumerable companies of angels. Now remember Nathaniel. Great worship this morning, by the way. <laughs> the presence of God was all over that. Oh, I could feel my spirits lifted. And Nathaniel was kind of a bit of a cynic in a good way, and his brother says, oh, we found the Messiah, and he said, oh, where, where, you know, Nazareth. Nazareth? Anything good come out of Nazareth? And the first thing that Jesus says to him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. And by the way, I saw you sitting under the tree over there. Wow, you must be a prophet. You're astounded at this? And then Jesus makes a statement. He says, he saith unto him, John 1, 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, we have consigned that phrase, Son of Man, exclusively to Christ, but to do so is not to understand the Bible correctly. Because Jesus identified himself with the Son of Man. Being the Son of God, he came down from heaven. He entered into the baptismal waters. And John says to him, no, I can't baptize you. He said, no, no, let it be done so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. He identified with sinful man, but redeemed the identity. And so when he says, hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, we now see ourselves in that picture because Ephesians 1, 22 to 23 says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so what we see is a picture of what God is doing and increasingly doing in the ecclesia, he is aligning ourselves, us as the house of God, with a ladder extended from the earth realm into heaven and angels ascending and descending upon the body of Christ for assignments. I was in a Central American country, I'm not going to mention the name, many years ago, and anyway, our interpreter David we were traveling from one place to another. It took about a four-hour journey. And he just casually mentioned, I hope we don't get stopped by the police. And I said, oh, why is that, David? He said, well, they're corrupt. He said, they don't really do much in the way of law enforcement. They'll stop you. And uh, if you're a foreign national, they'll take your passport. And they'll potentially confiscate it, throw you in jail until you come up with some money. I said, oh, right, OK. About an hour after that conversation, sure enough, there was a police checkpoint that was there. And uh, as we stopped, um, uh, the two policemen asked well, for our passports. There were five of us foreign nationals. We gave our passports over. And they handed all, everybody else's back except mine. And so I'm admiring the view. I'm just admiring the view. And David now is engaged in a rather intense discussion over my passport and me personally. And every now and again, he's... he's uh, uh, giving me what he's telling. He's saying that they say that you don't have a visa to enter the country, and I'm trying to tell them that I didn't, I, you don't need a visa uh, because the immigration department has stamped your passport. I'm just admiring the view. Oh, right, okay, you know. Mind in neutral, lovely view. God will sort it all out. Meanwhile, David is, is beginning to melt, and beads of perspiration are forming uh, across his forehead, and he's agitated. I'm not. I'm just admiring the view. I'm trusting God. And then they go away with my passport into the hut. This is not good. <laughs> but I'm still just admiring the view. Now, David is, is now, you know, he, he is distressed. And I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, 
Son, I think it would be a very good idea if you prayed just now. <laughs> right, Lord. I said, what do you want me to pray? He said, ask me to send the angels. Right. So I said it like this. Lord, please send the angels. There was no intensity, no passion. I wasn't, no, I wasn't doing any of this. On the... I said, Lord, please send the angels. Immediately out of nowhere, and I have no idea where he came from, this large policeman of that country suddenly appeared on the scene. Now, the men in that country are, comparatively speaking, quite small. I mean, this guy was huge. Probably about the same size as our saxophone player. Oh, I love that sound coming through. It was so anointed. The first thing he did was he faced that hut and he shouted into that hut. I don't know what he shouted in their native tongue. They came running out like two scalded cats, immediately handed my passport back to me, and all he did was just smile. And we're on our way. I have no idea whether that was a supernatural manifestation of an angelic being. I happen to think so. But he was certainly a messenger. And he came. I, 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 I can't even think of where he appeared from. There was no cover. He was just there in that moment. I was aware of a. I turned and he was there. Listen, we are partnering with angels in this season as never before. And out of this place of rest, out of this angelic partnership, God says, there will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. And this refers to government. The horn of David refers to the government of Christ. And we all know the scripture, Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, and upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. It has been increasing and growing in the earth realm, and it is going to rapidly increase exponentially exponentially. But the other part of that verse 17 in Psalm 132 was an ordained, ordained or prepared a lamp for mine anointed. And again, we have to understand this through New Testament eyes. And to borrow a, 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 a scripture from Proverbs, it says that the path of the just will grow brighter and brighter until the noonday sun. Listen, the company of God's people, the ecclesia, the new temple, the habitation of God through the Spirit is going to increase in luminosity before the Lord returns. Yes. Yes. And just in case you think anointed simply refers to Christ, this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he which establisheth us with you is Christ and hath anointed us. There is a glory glow, there is a luminosity that is coming to the ecclesia, the body of Christ, the like of which the world has never seen. And so when you begin to understand Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. Isn't that the same language that uh, the psalmist prays, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest? There is going to be an entrance of the glory of God into the body of Christ that there is a, an arising of the glory of God upon the ecclesia, and this is the lamp which he has prepared for his anointed. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Transfiguration. Matthew 17, it'll probably appear on your screens, but I'll just give you a summary of it. You may have heard me preach this before. This is what the Lord showed me. This curious, head scratching moment in time, immediately after Jesus says to Peter, I will build my ecclesia and the gates 
of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Immediately after that, we have the transfiguration story. Where there, Jesus is on the mountain, whether it's Mount Hymen or Tabor, we don't know, but he's there. And with him are Elijah and Moses. Who do they represent? The law and the prophets. And Jesus is transfigured. His earthly pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection body is transfigured. There is a luminosity and intensity of glory about him that had not been seen before during his earthly ministry. And this is still during his earthly ministry. And Jesus, um, Peter gets a bit befuddled, let's build three tabernacles. And God says, no, 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 no. Jesus, he, he, this is my beloved son, you listen to him. Now here it is. Faith works through love, does it not? The Spirit, the promise of the Spirit comes through faith. The intensity of the Spirit moving in and through the body of Christ is going to increase as faith increases. And faith works through love. And so there's a correlation between the intensity of love and the luminosity of the body of Christ. And Jesus here depicts this when he's talking with Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets. And Jesus was asked a question one time. Rabbi, which is the first and great commandment? He said, the first and great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Vertical love to God, horizontal love to uh, your neighbor. And Jesus said, upon these two hang all the law and prophets. What Jesus was saying is the body of Christ will come into a place of perfected love, and when it does, the glory of the Lord will be seen upon it in an intensity and in a way that has never been seen before. How's your love walk doing? Mine's not so good at times, but the Lord's working on it. We will not see a manifestation of the glory that God intends in the ecclesia until we get our love walk right. And then, says the Lord, ignition point happens. That our bounden duty and responsibility is to pray and position ourselves in such a way that from that place of rest, the Lord's rest, where His glory is, and the angelic ministry happens in partnership with us, that we begin to press ahead with which I and many other people believe is the promise for now. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. And so if you understand that, you understand that the flashing clouds in that time of rain have to do with lightning, which are the angels. Do you understand what we're saying here today? The time of the rain, or the latter rain and the time of the rain, ask for it, means that the body of Christ, the ecclesia, positioned with the fullness of God's authority, which has stepped in to fill the temple in an unprecedented way. We are the temple. And that place of rest, which the ecclesia rests and abides in his rest, that is where the maximization of angelic activity occurs. And so from that place of rest, that place of faith in the Spirit, we begin to partner with holy angels to see the outpouring, which I believe has already begun, and so many people will extend in such a way that it grows and amplifies. In the time of the latter rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain. Ezekiel chapter 1 says, And look, time, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof was the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst there came the likeness of four living creatures, angelic beings. Verse 13, And as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and the like appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. 
angels ascending and descending upon the body of Christ, flashes of lightning, angelic messengers being sent by the decrees of the ecclesia. Out of Zion, my people shall go forth uh, the law, the word of the Lord. And uh, Psalm 103 verse 20 says, those mighty ones, those angelic beings of his that do his bidding, hearkening to the voice of his word. And when you give word, as the Lord directs in the season and the time of the latter rain, you may expect flashes of lightning as angelic messengers go on assignment and see completion. My word shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish, it shall prosper, it shall break forth, it shall come mightily. From that place of entering into his rest, the glory of the Lord entering in to the ecclesia. And this is why it becomes so important for us to be spirit-filled. Have you ever wondered why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, go on being filled with the Spirit, go on being filled with the Spirit, go on being filled with the Spirit? Because spirit-filled believers, the ecclesia, is attractive to angelic messengers. Verse 12 of Ezekiel 1 tells us, And they went everyone straight forward, whither the Spirit was to go, they went. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, says Jesus. In this time, in this dispensation, so that the King of glory may come into his church. The infilling of the Spirit, the glory of the Lord entering into the ecclesia, into the new temple in a greater dimension because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there are the living creatures, there are the angels, there are, is the partnership between heaven and earth, the house of God and the gate of heaven. Second Corinthians 3, and I promise you, I, I'm almost through. This is so important. I don't want to miss anything. You can unpack it. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Why? Because angels flashing like lightning break chains of bondage and break the fetters that bind and the cords of wickedness are cut asunder. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. You see, in Ezekiel, the Spirit of the Lord left the temple. But in the latter chapters, verse 43, it returns to the temple. And we may have seen the dark ages in church's history, the ecclesia, that dry period of agricultural relevance of Israel before the outpouring of the last great rain, where the harvest comes in. And the glory of the Lord is coming into the ecclesia in a greater way, in whom ye are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2.22. And whither the Spirit was to go, they went, the angelic beings. Galatians 4, verse 6, we're coming back to sonship. You're not servants, you're sons. You're sons. You're sons. Our elder brother is the son of man. We are sons. Angels ascend and descend on sons in the kingdom. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Don't tell me that we can do without an ongoing infilling of the Holy Spirit. You, you neglect that. You neglect angelic partnership. And the word of God says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. James chapter 2, verse 12, I think it is. Why is that so important that we'll be judged according to the perfect law of liberty? Because the perfect law of liberty is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Has made us free from the law of sin and death. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We will be judged according to our words. We will be censored according to our uh, disposition and positioning. So that the fullness of the spirit is in us releasing that law of liberty. Where angels begin, as I have said, to minister and manifest that liberty of God. And so every word... 
every thought, every action that does not line up to that, God is saying, that's not good enough. You're still loved. You're still my son or daughter. But you need to come into that place of spiritual intensity where you begin to glow. The path of the just grows brighter and brighter until the noonday sun. And so where the Spirit of God is in the sons of God and the daughters of God, the angels are attracted. Hebrews 1, 7 says, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angel spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Verse 14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who should be heirs of salvation, kingdom assignments? Let's remind ourselves of Isaiah, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. God is in the business of executing kingdom extension and rule and authority through his ecclesia, and we better be filled with the Spirit. One remarkable scripture in 1 John 3, verses 2 to 3 says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, like Ezekiel seeing the glory of the Lord coming into the temple from the east afore, before. It doth not appear yet what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, already be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope about the transfiguration of the body of Christ, the glory entering into the ecclesia, Every man or woman that has this hope, this hope, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. There is a holiness that is coming upon the body of Christ. There is a purity that is coming to the bride without spot or wrinkle. And just like Esther prepared herself, where she was given favor by the king, up to half the kingdom. We have the entirety of the kingdom that has been delegated to us on earth, under our head, oh, who, who, we are part of his body. The gift of righteousness, how much more shall we reign in life through one Christ Jesus? And so when we understand that, it has, doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall perhaps already be like him. We're moving in that direction. And so where the Spirit is moving through that purity in the body of Christ, the ecclesia, as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared. Or oh, what did he prepare? A lamp ordained a lamp for his anointed, a preparation of a glorious infilling of the body of Christ, but he is revealing it to us by his Spirit in these days. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Conspare, comparing spiritual things with spirit. Why is that important? Why is it important to speak the things which the Holy Ghost teacheth? Because as Zion, his people, out of Zion shall go forth the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Out of Zion shall be spoken in words taught by the Holy Spirit, the very Word of God that is spoken in season. Oh, I wish that Isaiah 50 verse 4 was the hallmark of all of us. The Lord God has given us the tongue of the learned that we may know how to speak a word in season to the weary, to sow, to plant, to see the kingdom built and extended. Oh, you tie that up with scriptures like Matthew 1 verse 22 that says that it might be fulfilled uh, of the, by the Lord, that which was spoken, uh, that it might be fulfilled, that which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying. It's concerning the birth of Jesus 700 years before it was spoken. Or if you ever think that words are meaningless, 
or that you're only an ordinary person. What have you got to say? You are sadly mistaken. And I challenge you, repent because the kingdom of God is here. And repentance means a change of mind. You've got to see yourself how God sees you as part of the ecclesia, the ruling called out assembly to govern on earth through which the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Listen, when you begin to speak the very words of God, things begin to happen. You look at Isaiah chapter 55, verses 9 onwards, and you see how that works. And so we're coming into this time. And this happens by faith. You can't work it up. When the fire fell on Elijah's sacrifice at Mount Carmel, he didn't work it up. The prophets of Baal worked it up. They got all emotional, all in a tears, cut themselves. Elijah made it difficult for the Lord. He poured water on the sacrifice. God's not interested in your works per se. Yes, we are born again for good works, but we don't earn things by works. And so to enter into the fullness of this, we have to understand Galatians 3, and I'll fly through it and then we're through. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith. How did you receive the Spirit? By the hearing of faith. What we're about to enter in is going to be by the hearing of faith, knowing that you and I are already sons and daughters of the Most High God. Galatians 3, verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? By the hearing of faith. Galatians 3, 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. By faith we enter into that rest. By faith, we partner with the angels. By faith, we receive such an infilling of glory as the glory fills the ecclesia as the new temple. And I know I've shared an awful lot today. But I couldn't have left a single bit out. Because now as you unpack that and you meditate in it and you develop it, we all together will begin to move in that new dimension. Let's stand and pray together before I hand back to Apostle Jackie. loving Heavenly Father, we say, create in us clean hearts, O oh Lord. Begin to enlarge our hearts by the ministry of your Holy Spirit that we may run the way that you have set before us. And even after, as the fire fell on Mount Carmel, Elijah heard the sound of the abundance of rain and outran the chariots of Ahab. We declare in the name of Jesus that we, the ecclesia, will have supernatural legs. We have enlarged hearts that we will run the way at such speed and with such seamless supernatural grace that we will outrun the chariots of Ahab in this world, that we will see the government of God extended, that we will plant into the heavens and sow the word of God, that we will be filled with the glory. We will arise and shine because our light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon us. Just lay your hand upon your head, if you will. So, Father, transform us by the renewing of our minds. Renew us in the spirit of our minds. In Jesus' name. incredible word a lot to unpack but 
As I was sitting there and Kevin was coming toward the end of the message, I said, Lord, what what are you asking of us? And for today, what I heard was that there are some in the room that either need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because you never have, or you're just saying, Lord, I want more. I need to be filled up again. He references scripture that scripture says that we are to be being filled, continually being filled. It's not like you have a moment that you're filled and that's it. It's a progressive, ongoing. In fact, it's like the more you're filled, the more your capacity increases. And so, No matter how filled you are, fill it up again. Stretch out your capacity. So I've asked a few of our intercessors just to be available at the front. I'm just going to simply pray for you. It's not a counseling session. It's not a wanting you to tell them all your stuff. We're getting out of that, okay? New season. But if, if you're feeling that hunger today, Sandra, why don't you come join and pray with Patty? Or if we've got somehow. Just to come and say, Lord, I want more. I want more of you. I want to be so filled with Holy Spirit that I hear clearly what you're saying and I'm empowered to do according to what you say so just begin to come and I'm going to pray Father right now in the name of Jesus as these come just to be prayed over Lord, with a simple prayer, a simple touch, fill to overflowing, increase the capacity. Lord, I would say for everyone in this room, increase our capacity for Holy Spirit. Increase our capacity for the fullness of your grace and your glory. Unlock the movement of Holy Spirit within us. Unlock our tongues to praise you with other tongues and other languages. Unlock the the gifts that come with Holy Spirit. That as we receive you, and as you fill us up to overflowing, that we move at the impulse of your will. We move at the movement of your Spirit. And Holy Spirit, would you release among us mysteries of heaven release among us the freshness of the breath of God to see to hear to perceive to step out to speak to lay hands on to go where we've dared not go before but you're leading us by the spirit Lord, that the movement of Holy Spirit among us would continue to rise, that our capacity would be so increased that explosions of glory would come forth, that there would be the release of the flashings of lightning, the movement of the angelic host with us as we hear what Holy Spirit is saying and we move with you. I decree we're moving into a new place of partnering with Holy Spirit and with the angelic host as the ecclesia ruling and reigning out of Zion, moved not by what we perceive in the natural, but what we perceive by the Spirit. Break open, liberate, break open, and liberate in the mighty name of Jesus. Let it be. Let's worship.
If you need to leave, feel free. But I don't want to miss this moment. I don't want to miss this moment at all. If you've been moved and Holy Spirit is moving on you to even give, I saw some others during this message giving in response. Just do what Holy Spirit is saying. And don't forget, Melanie has jewelry out front and Kevin has his new book. And you want to avail yourself of those things. I bless you and we'll see you Tuesday night. Keep praying.